Hi, this is Whitney, your Neighborhood Academic Support Specialist, and today we're going to talk about writing the results and discussion sections of your research report, your DNP final project manuscript, your um, research article, whatever you want to call it. So we'll start with the results section. And I like to talk about what things are and are not before we get started. So what is the results section and what isn't it? What it is, is the centerpiece of the paper. It's a presentation of your findings. Um, so data and analysis of that data. It's true to the research question or questions and it should be factual and unbiased. What it isn't is commentary or speculation on all of that stuff. It's not the place for commentary. So, a little comparison here of results versus discussion, because we're going to want to have both of those in our paper. Results is reporting of findings. So, what did you do? What was your intervention? What was the timeline of your project? What were the changes that you made as you went along? What tests did you use? What were the results of the tests? Any context that you need in terms of stuff that, you know, maybe needed adjustment along the way, explain any missing data, where you put tables and figures to help you show your data, and then when you get to discussion is where you interpret your findings. So strengths and weaknesses, limitations of your project, comparison of your findings to those of other researchers, and implications, meaning the so what question. Now that we know all this, what do we do with it? So um, it's a good idea with the results section to use the tables and figures as much as possible. But the important thing to remember about tables and figures is that they have to make sense on their own. So what a lot of people will, will fall into, a pitfall, if you will, that a lot of people will fall into, is they'll put a table in the text, and then they will just fully explain the table in the text. There's really no point in doing that. The whole point of using a table is to be explanatory and to save you space in your manuscript so that you don't have to go into a great deal of explanation. So you can refer to your tables and figures, but don't just repeat the same exact information that's in them in the text because you don't need to, it's redundant. If it's a good table or figure, it will speak for itself. You wanna write clearly and logically, build a step-by-step -step narrative. You're telling a story. So you wanna begin your results section with a short introduction, just you know, two, three, four sentences. Lead your readers smoothly into the section and then guide them through step by step. You want to, um, if you haven't done so already in your method section, describe your subjects of your project, number and demographics of participants, including any subgroups, the number that were excluded or not included for whatever reason. And if you have lots of demographic data, it's a good idea sometimes to make a table to explain all of that rather than to get into it in the text, which can be long and take up a lot of space. You don't want to repeat information from your methods section though. So if you've already done all that, then you don't have to do it again. Put your main findings first, secondary findings next. And that same structure, by the way, should be previewed in the introduction of your paper, your purpose statement, and the description of your measures in methods. So whatever order you present things in, keep that consistent all throughout the paper. If there are subgroups, then present the findings for the whole sample first, and then you can get into your subgroups. So whole sample, then subgroups. Make sure you're always using clear, straightforward language. I always say don't try to sound smart because it's usually going to accomplish the opposite of that and I include myself in that rule. Just clear, easy to understand, straightforward. Don't try to sound flowery. Just, you know, tell it to me like it is. Address all your research questions. You can use subheadings if you need to. And this is a big one, report negative, negative findings, which basically means if there's a mess, address that mess. You don't want to sweep things under the rug just because they're inconvenient or because they didn't end up the way you thought they were going to. If your findings surprise you, that's fine. That can actually be a good thing. Sometimes that helps us narrow down the problem. Sometimes that will lead us to further studies down the road. So if there's a mess, address that mess. Don't try to sweep it under the rug. You also want to make sure you're addressing um, any surprising or contradictory findings. 
you, you're not going to do that in results, you're going to do it in discussion, but make sure you're doing it. Make sure the data in your tables and figures are consistent with the data in the text. That sounds really obvious. You'd be surprised how often people don't do it, so make sure everything matches up. Data and related statistical analysis should be reported together, right? That's just very clear and straightforward so it doesn't get confusing. And you use an uppercase N for the total sample and a lowercase N for a part of the sample. For means and other descriptive statistics include standard deviations or SD. When reporting confidence intervals or CI, indicate your level of confidence. And APA actually has a recommended format for that so you can check your 7th edition APA handbook or if you don't have that you can look at the Purdue OWLS very comprehensive 7th edition APA style guide. And in the text, use the statistical term, not the symbol. So if you're actually in the text of a sentence as opposed to in parentheses, use the word mean rather than the M, right? The mean score was, not the M score was. Just more little tips. And I have this here. I will put these in the description. When I do this as a workshop in class, I will go through and read all of this. I think for um, YouTube viewership, we'll just put this in the description and um, you can go and read this if you want. There's a wonderful book, as you can see there, um, Writing for Publication in Nursing. There's been a whole bunch of different editions of it. I think the latest is the fifth edition. And they give wonderful examples of every single thing that they describe in that book. So there's an example of um, a qualitative results section in there and an example of a quantitative results section so that you can see in action what I'm describing to you here. So I'll put these in the description and you can go find them on your own if you want to see samples. Now let's move on to the discussion section. So what is the discussion section and what isn't it? Well, it is where you make meaning from your results. So now what? Now that we know all this, what does it mean? What do we do with it? What do we do next? And what it isn't, of course, is it just a repeat of your results section. So this is where we're interpreting our results. So that can mean a lot of things. It can mean the relationship between your intervention and the outcomes, the effects of the project on the stakeholders, individuals and systems, or the whole organization, Differences between expected and actual findings. If you expected to find A and you found Z instead, why might that be? And what does that suggest? And where do we go from here with that? Do we need to narrow down something a little bit more? Do we need to dig into a particular aspect of the question? Lots of stuff. You can also talk in this part about strengths and weaknesses, or as we call it, limitations of your project. And sometimes that can mean that, you know, it's not generalizable to everyone because of X, Y, or Z um, with regard to the sampling, or um, sometimes it has to do with methodology or design. A lot of times it's sample size. It can be anything. It depends on your project. But think about the limits. And it's important that you do that because obviously we want to indicate our level of confidence with what we've found. So we don't want people making sweeping practice changes or policy changes if the evidence is not super duper strong or if there are pretty significant limitations. If you've you know had a sample size of 10 people, you know we're not going to want to change like nationwide policy based on that necessarily. It's also where we can compare our findings to those of other researchers. So you did, I'm assuming, a literature review for this paper. What did everybody else find? How is it similar? How is it different? And then implications or next steps. And that can mean for future research, for the next people down the road who study this, or for you when you study it in more depth. It can mean implications for practice. So with D and P students, a lot of times it's going to be practice related. Do we change what we're doing? And sometimes it can be as big as policy and legislation or um, organiz you know, on the leadership level, administrative level, on the you know, at hospitals or whatever. So it can mean a lot of different things. And I would at least spend some time thinking about each of those three things, even if you don't necessarily address all of them in the paper, at least spend some time thinking about them as you're writing your manuscript. So how do we begin a discussion section? Well, we're going to start with the answer to our research question, or sometimes, again, mess, sometimes we're going to find that we didn't get an answer, and that's fine too. We can just clarify that at the beginning of the discussion section. 
Resist the temptation to only cite studies that agree with your findings. If you're doing that, you're doing you a disservice and you're doing your reader a disservice as well. We gotta address that mess. Because if there's mess, there's mess. And there's mess for a reason. And the reason can be very illuminating. So don't just cite stuff that agrees with you. Why might findings differ? Well, there's a million reasons why. Could be differences in the setting in the participants, in the measurements used, in the analysis of the data. And exploring the reasons for those differing results can really help clarify the state of the science on the topic. So we want to make sure to get into that and get your hands dirty. That's the best part, really, once you get into it. It can seem intimidating at first, but that's really where the nitty-gritty is. Make sure not to just repeat your background information in discussion. So background, you know, and we'll, I'm going to do another video. I'm going to do a video about every section, basically, um, of this DNP final uh, manuscript or research manuscript, whatever. Um, but the background is more foundational. It's like a setup for here's the problem and here's why it's a problem and why we should care about it. The, you know, that's all sort of setting the stage. The discussion section is not a repeat of that. The discussion section is about how your findings from your project dovetail with those of previous studies, what all that means, where we go from here with it. So um, where we go from here with it, again, implications could be for practice, bedside nursing, you know, what do we do differently with patients, or for policy, for further research. And be careful not to overstate. Sometimes a practice change is warranted based on results of a project, sometimes it's just not. Sometimes we're not there yet, and that's okay. That's not a failure. That's just where it's at sometimes. So again, I'll put these in the description. If you want to see an example discussion slash conclusion section, I will put one in the description for you. And just to recap what we have learned, the results and discussion sections are two distinct elements of your manuscript. They're not repetition of the same information. Neither should be phoned in, by the way. They should both be nice, you know, well-fleshed-out sections of the paper. I've literally seen people do a one-paragraph discussion that is painfully inadequate. You don't want to do that. They should both be written clearly, concisely, and logically. The results is a reporting of findings, often with the help of visual aids like tables and figures, and the discussion is an interpretation of the findings. Here's a quick references list um, for some more resources. I've got that Writing for Publication in Nursing book at the top there. We've got the Squire Author Guidelines, um, PLL, PLOS Writing Center, How to Write Discussions and Conclusions, Elsevier um, Author Services is a great resource, How to Write the Results section of a research paper. All of those will give you more info if you want it. And again, check out the description for those articles where you can go and look at samples of the things we've talked about today. I hope that was helpful.